Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Down by the Bay Learning Series with the Center for Alaskan Coal Studies. My name is Seth Spencer, and today we're going to be talking about winter animal adaptations, and specifically winter animal adaptations here in Alaska. Before we get into what those adaptations might look like, I want us to think about what are things that all animals in the entire world might need to survive? I think for a little bit, most people can guess all animals need food, all animals need water, air, shelter, and space. Now, of course, all animals need different amounts of food, water, air, space, and shelter, such as uh, animals in the desert can go a long time without water, or a moose needs a lot more space than a red-backed bull. But at some point in their lives, all animals need food, water, air, space, and shelter. And so you can then think, well, in winter in Alaska, uh, different parts of Alaska can get well below zero degrees Fahrenheit, uh, or not see the sun for a really long time, or food might be covered under five, six, seven feet of snow. And so winter can be a very challenging time for animals uh, throughout Alaska. And so, uh, Animals have dealt with this in a few different ways, and there are three main ways that animals uh, figure out how to survive winter in Alaska, and that is what we're gonna be talking about today. And so we're gonna be going through some different pictures of these animals and really thinking about what is a way that that animal has uh, decided to change either their, their body or their behavior to uh, get through long, cold, dark winter nights. So join me as we go along. Winter animal adaptations, the three main ways to survive winter in Alaska. Uh, the first that we're gonna talk about is something that maybe some people wish they could do uh, during some winters, which is to sleep all winter long. Uh, and we call this long time sleeping, we call it hibernation. Hibernation is when animals are dormant for long periods of time, which usually is in the winter. And we're gonna go through a couple of different examples of animals that hibernate, or kind of slow their bodies down, and we'll talk about maybe different ways that animals hibernate. But I'm also gonna have you guess by looking at an animal, does this animal actually hibernate? So we'll start with our first one. Here we have a picture of a Canada lynx. You might be able to tell that lynx is standing in snow. So you are right, no, this animal does not hibernate all winter long. They will, uh, we will talk about them shortly, but they actually are adapted well to surviving winters. Okay, our brown or grizzly bear that you can see here is a very common example of an animal that hibernates. Now bears are a little tricky. Uh, they don't necessarily do a true hibernation in that they go to sleep, they wake up, they might go to the bathroom, they go back to sleep. So they're not asleep for the entire time or the entire winter, but they are maybe dormant or they slow their bodies down quite a bit. Okay, our wonderful moose here. Uh, moose, you might think they're a big animal. It's hard to walk in the snow. Why would they be spending time in the winter? They should hibernate. Well, these moose do, did not adapt to hibernate. We'll come back to them. They do actually spend their winters moving around. Okay, probably our best example of a true hibernator here in Alaska is this Arctic ground squirrel. They can sleep or be dormant six to nine months of the entire year. And the advantage of that is that they're not having to find food or store food. They can just go out in the summer, find a mate, eat a lot, go back to sleep. Uh, and, but they allow their bodies to almost completely shut down and their heart to really slow down uh, throughout the winter. So we have, we've talked about our brown, our grizzly bear. Here is our wonderful black bear. And black bears are another example of an animal that hibernates. And they hibernate throughout their range throughout North America, different amounts of time, depending on how cold or long the winter is. Um, but brown and black bears hibernate, whereas a polar bear, they uh, can hibernate, but most of them don't. They are actually out in the winter looking for food. You might look at this and go, what in the heck is that? Well, this is a little brown bat. Yes, we do have bats in Alaska, but most of us have not seen a lot of them because they come out pretty late at night, even though it might still be light out. 
uh, and move around, and they are not as common as in maybe parts of the lower 48. But this little brown bat is interesting that it actually does two different ways to survive in Alaska. They actually move outside of Alaska, most of them, uh, and then hibernate in large colonies, maybe in a cave or a tree. Uh, and that is because uh, their main food source insects are gone in the winter. So it doesn't make sense for them to try to survive winter. They go to go to sleep. We're going to end with another hibernator, though this one is really tricky. This is a wood frog. And wood frogs, uh, which is our most common amphibian here in Alaska and the only amphibian that we have here in the Homer, Alaska area, they do something completely different than almost any other animal in the world, which is they allow their bodies to actually freeze during the winter. So in maybe uh, October, November, when it starts to get below freezing, they allow their bodies to freeze, the cells to kind of freeze, and then all winter long, they're frozen in the mud. Uh, and then once the temperatures start getting above 32, their cells start to kind of thaw out. And I would do a little more research on this. It's pretty crazy what these wood frogs can allow their bodies to do every single winter. So we've talked about our hibernators. We have our light sleepers, which are our bears our true hibernators, which are brown squirrels and bats, and then those interesting wood frogs. So we're gonna move on. We talked about animals that might sleep, but stay in Alaska. We're now gonna talk about another group of animals that uh, most of them might leave Alaska or move to different parts of Alaska to get away from those really dark, cold nights. And that seasonal movement from one place to another is called migration. And we usually think of migration as maybe a north to south movement, and it often is, though we can have east to west movements or high altitude, high elevation to low elevation. These are all different types of migration. We have our great caribou, which often looks like a reindeer, they're very similar, um, but our caribou actually are migrators. Uh, they are moving from maybe really high parts of or really far north parts of Alaska to a little further south where you, they might be able to find a few more grasses and twigs to survive winter in Alaska, but they are one of the largest land migrators uh, in the world. This is a red squirrel. If you spent any time where there might be red squirrels, you know they are not migrators. I put this one in here to trick you. Uh, they actually do a couple different things to adapt or change to be able to deal with winter, but they don't leave uh, their home during the winter. Probably one of the best known migrators in the world are whales, and this specifically is our humpback whale. Here around Homer, most of our whales in the summer are going uh, down to Hawaii in the winter. They're having babies, eating a lot of food, and then coming back, or they're having babies and coming back up to find really good food in the summer. And that's why a lot of our animals do migrate. Uh, there's not much food here in Alaska in the winter. There's so much food, whether that be insects or uh, grasses, flowers, or even fish in the summer. Though, uh, if you spend time around uh, Kachemak Bay or Prince William Sound or Southeast Alaska, you know that not all whales migrate. We do have some juvenile uh, whales that do spend their winters here as well. Sandhill cranes are a beautiful example of a high, uh, migrator. Uh, all sandhill cranes are going to travel south outside of Alaska in the winter. They just can't handle our cold uh, winters. And then about this time here in uh, mid-April to early May, so if you are in Alaska right now, definitely keep your eyes but also ears open for these kind of crazy sounding birds as they head back to far northern Alaska to uh, eat a ton of food and then have babies and then turn around and head back south again. This is a sockeye or red salmon. Salmon are a migrator, though they are not a very typical migrator. They do start in fresh water, they move on out into salt water and spend most of their lives in salt water and at the end of their lives they're going to turn return to fresh water to lay eggs and fertilize and then have babies and then they die. So it's not a very common way to migrate, but that is what our salmon in Alaska do. Cowdy, another tricky one. Uh, cowdies are not migrators. They are uh, an example maybe more of a scavenger, an animal that's going to do whatever it can to survive winter in Alaska by maybe changing their diets or moving around quite a bit to be able to find food. Bald eagles. 
So bald eagles are, are of course, birds, uh, and I've talked about birds being a migrator, though here in Alaska, I can look out my window right now and see a few different birds. So not all birds migrate outside of Alaska, and the bald eagle, especially around Homer, uh, some do head south, but quite a few hang out by our open ocean water and find food all winter long. So we've talked about our migrators, we've talked about our hibernators, and we're gonna finally end with our adapters, which is basically animals that figure it out or die. And so these are animals that uh, have either changed something about their body or changed something about the way that they behave to be able to deal with cold temperatures, very little food, and not much light. So this aggressive looking deer is a Sitka black-tailed deer. Uh, and one way that they have adapted is to harsh winters. They don't really live in places in Alaska that we get a ton of snow or really cold temperatures. They don't live way up in Fairbanks. They live very closely around those coastal areas where the temperatures uh, don't get super below zero. They don't get as much snow. Um, so that's how they have adapted more their behavior. Again, coming back to that bald eagle, maybe a behavioral adaptation, they move a little bit or migrate a little bit uh, to coastal areas where there's open ocean water, but they don't have to head all the way down to Washington or other parts of the lower 48. Our red squirrel, uh, if you have spent some time in the, in the summer, you might have seen squirrels frantically going around gathering uh, things like spruce cones and stashing it in big piles of kind of trashy, cones they've already eaten called a squirrel midden and so these squirrels are kind of storing up food uh, for the winter so that they don't have to go around and try to find as much food as uh, that can be really hard if it's really cold also a little dangerous if there are predators around that are really hungry so they try to kind of keep close to those squirrel middens our coyotes and our wolves are uh, those animals that maybe do a little more scavenging or uh, have done some uh, changes to their bodies. So both coyotes and fox and wolves all grow thicker fur. So thicker fur to be able to trap in some more heat and maybe prevent them getting wet from that snow. Uh, and wolves are actually going to be sort of migrating, but they're not uh, changing by season. What they're doing is following their prey, which here in Alaska are mostly moose, around through the winter. Our beautiful Canada lynx. Uh, so just from this picture you might be able to see that lynx uh, do have a really nice thick fur coat that goes all the way around their face uh, and keeps them nice and warm and insulated in the winter. And this you can't really tell but their their feet have adapted over time to be very large. And if you've ever seen a moose try to step in the snow they sink every step and you might think that's a lot of work. Well the lynx decides I don't want to do that work. And they have really big thick feet to be able to stay on top of the snow and that's really helpful to chase their prey around which are snowshoe hares. Wolverines. Not a lot of, uh, is known about wolverines. Uh, they don't typically hibernate. They're not migrators so they're going to be more of those scavengers figuring out or dying throughout the winter. This is a cool bird called a willow ptarmigan and ptarmigan are one of the few birds in the world that uh, change their, their feather color specifically to be able to camouflage in the winter. There are a lot of birds that change their colors different parts of the year from maybe very bright colors to attract a mate to very dull colors in the winter because it's not really worth all that energy. But this bird, this ptarmigan, changes its color to white in the winter and brown in the summer to be able to camouflage or hide in those different environments. Uh, also, you might be able to see that this ptarmigan has feathers all the way to its feet to be able to maybe uh, protect its feet from getting too cold on that snow and ice. Our cool little short-tailed weasel, or more commonly in Alaska called an ermine. Ermines are another animal that in the winter change from all white to all brown in the summer, again to be able to maybe sneak up on some small prey like this red-backed bull or a squirrel, and also hide from larger predators such as coyotes. Again, coming back to birds, uh, you would think this tiny little black-capped chickadee would definitely head south, get out of Alaska if it can. 
we do have quite a few songbirds that spend their winters and one adaptation that these songbirds have is they eat a lot, uh, but they also are able to fluff up their feathers quite a bit when it's really cold and trap in some of that warm air that's being produced by their bodies. A very well-known adapter is our snowshoe hare. Uh, they again camouflage by changing from all brown in the summer to all white in the winter, and then again have really large feet to be able to stay on top of the snow and hide from that lynx. And again, our moose, uh, their adaptations are to uh, move around and find food. Uh, they have really long legs to stay, uh, be able to stay on top of the snow, though they do sink, they're able to at least walk around in the snow. They do grow a slightly thicker fur coat. And then uh, with this big male bull moose, you can see they got big old antlers. Well, in the mid to late winter, they actually drop those, um, partly uh, because it's just a lot easier to not have to walk around with these heavy things on, and then in the spring, they'll start regrowing them. So again, our adapters, they figured out or die, and they do this by maybe growing a thicker coat, having camouflage, or changing some of their feeding habits to follow food and eat more often. I do want to be able to show you a few examples of these uh, adaptations that animals might have to survive. And uh, probably the easiest one to show you is what they can do with their bodies. So I'm going to start with this very large bird, very dark brown, maybe a little blonde, big old face. You may be able to tell it's from a brown or a grizzly bear, and big old paws with sharp nails. And you're like, well, Seth, you said that they hibernate, so they don't have to have thick fur coats. Well, yes, they do hibernate for much of the winter, but uh, maybe in October, November, or early spring, it's still quite cool out. So it is uh, an advantage to be able to have a thicker fur coat in those cold winter months. Another very large animal here in Alaska, this pelt or fur with a big old face, big old ears, and big old paws. It's from our, our gray wolf. Uh, and again, uh, they have not necessarily adapted to be able to walk on the snow, but they do have a really thick fur coat to be able to uh, insulate or trap in heat to be able to survive the winter. Our next very large animal, again, nice, thick, very soft fur coat. A little hard to tell with its face, but you might uh, see those really pointy ear tufts, which do make this a Canada lynx. I see those giant, almost as big as my face, paws to be able to walk on top of the snow. And so far you might ask, well, why are there no animals that are bright red or green in Alaska, whereas in many parts of the tropics they have lots of bright colors? And you probably can answer that one for yourselves, that a lot of our uh, trees and shrubs are not bright colors, and so if you are a bright color, you stand out, which can be great for maybe attracting a mate, but it's not good because every animal can see you, and you become prey pretty quickly. So you can't really tell uh, exactly what this animal is, but we do have these uh, bright white colors here of our snowshoe hare, our snowshoe hare, that do change color in the winter. And one animal, one animal I did not talk about earlier is this one, another color animal that changes colors in the winter from our little arctic fox. And arctic fox are interesting because you think, oh, they're, they're predators, why would they need to be able to camouflage? Well, they are predators of really small animals such as bulls or lemming, but they also do have to be able to hide from a much larger predator, a polar bear. And then we'll end with uh, this tiny little animal that camouflages. You might have seen a picture earlier. This is from a short-tailed weasel or an ermine. Uh, and they are very small. They can weigh less than a pound, though they are eating prey, such as redback wolves or even squirrels, that can be larger than them. Well, folks, I want to thank you so much for joining me today and learning a bit more about winter animal adaptations. Uh, I will post a few links to videos to learn a bit more about some of these. Uh, adaptations or ways that animals survive uh, in the comment section below this video.
overall, get out inside, explore, learn as much about these amazing animal adaptations as you can. Thank you for joining us for this Down by the Bay learning series with the Center for Alaskan Coast Studies.